Okay, I'm Chris Conacher from Computer Audiophile, and everyone here is here to for how to buy a hi-fi system. Who here has not bought a hi-fi system? <laughs> We're good. Right? Okay. <laughs> Thanks, Joe. <Shilzo. laughs> You've already done Thanks it. for coming. <laughs> <laughs> so Phil and Josh have been uh, wonderful to join us here today. Um, why don't you guys introduce yourselves and say a little bit about your business and you know what you do. Uh, I'm Phil Murray, Vice President of Marketing and E-Commerce at Listen Up. We've been in business. Uh, actually, next week will be our 45th anniversary. Um, and so the business started before you were born, right? Uh, I wish. <laughs> I actually started shopping there in '74, and then went to work for him in '87. <laughs> so, uh, but we've been around for a long time and do a lot of high-end two-channel stereo as well as home automation and uh, commercial and all kinds of things. So, And uh, I'm Josh Samuel. Uh, I own Recycled Audio Incorporated. And uh, th this June I'll be in business 40 years. Um, and Phil and I go back to a long, long time. <laughs> uh, my business started when I was 23 years old and uh, enjoyed a very close relationship with Listen Up for many years, uh, helping them move very large numbers of high-end audio equipment, uh, which at the time uh, there were a very few stores only in this country that specialized in that. Uh, and, uh, and that's who I am. Excellent, excellent. So how to buy a hi-fi? I've been thinking about this, and when we think about a hi-fi system, I think it's changed uh, drastically over the years, because when I think about it now, I have to include like the all-in-one speaker units, because for a lot of people, that could be the hi-fi system, like the name Muso or something like that. Um, I use one at home, and I just totally love it. And when I go home and see my five-year-old daughter and my wife jamming Beyonce super loud. It makes me happy because it's on a name and it sounds great and stuff like that. So if I'm walking in or calling you guys up to buy a hi-fi system, what, where do you start? I mean, do you consider those systems as well or do you think regular hi-fi or kind of how does this work? You know, I think it's wherever and however people get enjoyment from music. And you're right, it could be something like a name Muso. It could even be a JBL Bluetooth speaker. I mean, some of the best musical experiences I've had have been just driving around listening in my car. Uh, so, you know, I think it depends on the person's lifestyle. I talked to a, a writer from 5280 magazine who was doing a blog post about Audio Fest, and it was interesting talk. he was in his probably late 20s I would guess and it was interesting talking to him because the whole he was the whole concept of sitting down and listening to music and doing pretty much nothing else was so foreign to him and he started asking me about Bluetooth speakers and and so uh, to me, it just depends on the person's lifestyle and, and what do they want to have a dedicated listening area or do they want to spread music throughout the house? Um, is this going to be their main source? Uh, I think you can derive enjoyment from all of the above. So, And yeah, I, I agree with Phil. Uh, you know, it's correct. This is not a... a something that's a necessity. It, it's something that uh, uh, in, ma in many respects is a luxury and if it isn't bringing you happiness and if it isn't making you feel good then uh, you really have no business owning it. It, it. You need to buy something that you know fits your lifestyle like Phil said and it, and it, and it should be something that makes you feel good. It shouldn't be something that somebody talks you into. Uh, and that you're buying on the basis of, well, he's an expert, I, I should buy it, and uh, I should feel good because he says it's good. Uh, and that, that's, not, that's not how I, uh, when I'm dealing with customers, deal with them. We, you know, we'll, we'll talk for a while about what 
you know, what is important in their lives, their finances, you know, what, what type of budget you have, and, uh, and then take it from there. Uh, where a sales professional becomes important is, and not everybody has this knowledge, but uh, the, I, I know Phil has it. We've been in this business so long that, you know, understanding theory of how things are built and the things that are important, uh, that's where a professional can, can help you understand why, why this is a good piece to buy. And then you can uh, incorporate that into your parameters as to what is important. Uh, I'll give you an example. You could, you could go to a, a big chain store and see a piece of equipment there and uh, the salesman says that's 200 watts. You know, and, and, and uh, it's $200. Uh, and you feel great. I just, I just got a great value, 200 watts, $200. But what it boils down to is that w without understanding what's behind discussion of wattage and understanding there's other things involved that maybe are way, way more important than that one spec, uh, you know, such as the, how the power supply is built, the slew rate, headroom, uh, those, all of a sudden you can understand why I don't want that piece and why I would like the 25 watt piece that's built so much better. Uh, that's where a professional uh, can really help when searching a, a system and incorporate that with what your goals are. That, yeah, that's a good point. I don't know how many conversations I've had with people I know. Well, 200 watts, that's got to be better than the 25 <laughs> watt piece. It just has to be. Yeah. So. Yeah, that conversation happens all the time. So you touched on something interesting, um, and I think I know the answer to this, but do you guys ever uh, say, well, you know, Joe Sixpack wrote about this piece online and he likes it, so you must go buy it. I, I look at that as like, I, I tell people, don't believe what I say, please don't. <laughs> go read, or I mean, go listen to this for yourself. So how does the role of, say, product reviews or anything like that come into play when you guys are talking to somebody else about buying a hi-fi system? Well, I, I think one thing that I've seen and, and certainly saw when I sold on the floor was people would be very much driven by reviews. And I had one customer who bought a, you know, this is back when the Mark Levinson transport was a hot thing and he bought a Mark Levinson transport from me. He bought a EAD DAC from another dealer. He bought his speakers for me, bought an amp and preamp from somebody else. And he ended up with a system, kind of what you were talking about. He just hated. And um, I think he would have been better served to just find one audio guru, if you will, to kind of help guide him through and really take a system approach. And it was kind of funny because he ended up, he got so frustrated, he came in and traded everything in to me and bought a Bang & Olufsen system. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, and, and he was happy with the Bang & Olufsen system. Um, but he had spent two or three years on this process and it was, all his purchases were driven by whatever had gotten the hottest review in Stereophile or the absolute sound. Uh, this was pre-internet days, and he just got way off the path and was pretty frustrated by the end of it. So when I look at reviews and over the years, I never really read a lot about the reviews, but what I did like to read uh, uh, always fascinated me was when the best of came out. and you'd have several categories where uh, an absolute sound or stereophile where, uh, of course, there's a class where there's no holds barred, price no object, uh, and then you had the class A, you had the class B, you had the class C, and even the class D was still hands and feet above your normal stuff. But within each one of those categories, there was always something that was recommended that had stars by it and it was not the most expensive piece in the category. And th that was the best value within that category. And it always fascinated me, those items that uh, 
in a category that was things three, four, five, six times its price, it managed to get in there based on its its value and quality in, in terms of sound performance. And so I, I always paid a lot of attention to those pieces, and those are the pieces I like to go out because I didn't have an unlimited budget for myself. And uh, I found a lot of those items tended to be really, really good quality. And some of them, the price was astounding how inexpensive it was. You know, uh, I, I remember, uh, I don't know if you remember the Marantz MA500, a long, <laughs> thin, little 125 watt module that retailed for $329 and for some reason would get into the Class C category as best value. And uh, it sounded good. McCormick, McCormick, which Steve McCormick made amazing stuff on very, very small budgets as far as compared to things that were selling for tens of thousands of dollars. And he'd always get in the Class A category with an amp that retailed for $2,000, right? And uh, and they sounded very good, and so I pay. I used to pay a lot of attention to those things, because that represented to me great value. Cool. So, can you guys talk about the importance of the the brand or the company who sells the product? Because I think online now more than ever we see a lot of products pop up from whether it's Joe's Garage or uh, a country very far from here, um, company just pops up and they have every spec under the sun, DSD 1024, I mean, whatever you want. And people jump on it and buy it, order it straight in, and then six months later the company's gone and you, know, you have something that doesn't work. So obviously you guys vet the brands you do business with, but can you talk about kind of the importance in companies that have been a, a lot around for a while and how maybe an example or two of how that has really saved the customer? Well, uh, doing business with a company that's around, the, you, you, you brought up the issue of if something goes wrong, you can have it fixed. And uh, that, that's very important, uh, I think, in, in the industry is having a company that stands behind its product. Um, you know, and, and, you know, PS Audio. So there, there's there's great companies out there that uh, have been around forever. They make great products. Uh, it, they, those products also tend to hold better value when they get to the used market. Uh, so a lot of these smaller companies that are just getting started, although they may make a great product, uh, a lot of them only are around a year or two. Uh, and so you're investing heavily in the product on the front end and then when it comes time that you want something else, you find it's, it's worth a fraction of what you paid. So I, I believe very strongly in, in when uh, buying audio equipment, making sure you're getting a good value. And that's not only limited to paying the right price, it's not only limited to buying it at the right time in its life cycle so you can get a good deal, uh, but it's also, uh, it's also important that the company you're dealing with uh, also will be around for a while because that all contributes to, it, uh, to its ultimate value. As time goes on, you're going to want to trade it, you're going to want to get something different, uh, and if it, unless money is not an object to you, uh, you have to watch that you're buying accordingly and properly so that you can continue the enjoyment of the hobby you like to do, which over time is seeing what other equipment is out there. So if you buy at the right price, at the right time, from the right company, then in two years when you want to get something else, it doesn't hurt very much. In fact, maybe you get, you recoup your purchase price. And then you get to experience something different. So if you really love audio, uh, that's a great way to keep your hobby and be safe. Yeah, I would totally agree as a retailer uh, our relationship with the customer is going to go a lot longer uh, than a lot of the manufacturers. And so we do take 
uh, a lot of time in vetting manufacturers before we bring them in, knowing that they're going to be around. So. so let's talk about, this is something that I hear a lot and read a lot of questions about. Um, people ask, what percentage of the amount I want to spend do I spend on each category of the system? Like, do I spend 50% on the speakers and 10% on the cables? And it drives me crazy, um, that kind of logic. So do people come in and ask you guys the same things? Or you know, what do you guys think about buying that way? You know, I don't really see that a whole lot from customers uh, the way maybe we did 20 years ago. Um, and I think there's a lot of great products out there, uh, like amplifiers. In fact, if David was here, I would say something nice about his, but I won't. Um, <laughs> but where you can spend, uh, you know, you can get a great value on an amplifier and then put more money into the speakers. Um, there's a, it seems to me there's a lot more products like that these days. And then you can enjoy the system and go back and, and maybe get better electronics and your speakers will sound even better. So uh, I think it's kind of a process and, and um, uh, every, everyone's different. <laughs> yeah. You know, there's the Lin approach where you put all your money into the source um, and in certain instances that can make a lot of sense too. So in looking at d dividing up price, uh, you, you know, you talk about Lynn and they, uh, you know, they want you to put your money in your source. It's always been, you know, my understanding, at least for my experiences, is where you get the most bang for your buck is, is at the start and at the end of the system. So the beginning, the source, and the end result, your speakers. Uh, is where you get your biggest effect uh, as far as spending your money. Uh, so in between, you're going to have preamp and power amp. And uh, a lot of people are very confused in that arena in that they, <coughs> they think that I, the power amp is going to make such a huge difference for me. And the reality is, is that the preamp has a much more dramatic effect on the differences in sound than the power amp has. Uh, granted, the power amp has its place, uh, but the preamp, and in specific, having a, uh, a lot of people are, uh, you know, are, don't know tube or solid state. Well, if you like tube, your tube preamp is going to make a much bigger difference in changing the sound of your system than the power amp. But in the power amp, you have a couple, yeah, there's three different categories, actually four, because now you have the, you know, the digital category, but you have, uh, you could have solid state, you could have tube, or you could have IC chip. And the IC chip is why Best Buy says it's 200 watts and <laughs> it's $200. Well, it has no headroom, has no power supply, has no slew rate. So again, yeah, it's got 200 watts, and it's got a, a power supply the size of your thumbnail, and uh, uh, it sounds like a tin radio. Well, that's because there's no bass notes. Well, there's no bass notes because the bass notes really do need power. Everything else doesn't. So then you, you, you get into transistors, uh, which transistors uh, are very reliable, uh, have great slew rate, and uh, can really produce tight bass, you know, so uh, tight bass, uh, but it also has the downside of it reproduces what's called odd, odd order harmonics. And odd order harmonics is what the human ear hates to listen to, and that's why uh, uh, if it isn't built nicely, uh, that uh, solid state transistor power amp after a couple hours you want to turn it off it didn't sound that great and I want to go do something else well then you get to a tube power amp well the tube the tube power amp uh, is not uh, terribly efficient in producing bass 
but has that sweet spot. And, uh, and if you look at the, uh, the, the specs on a tube amp, it could be 5%, it could be 10%. But why is it I like the sound of that tube amp? Why is it that, to me, it's got that sweet sound in the mid-range and the high-end range that really, really makes me like what I'm listening to? And uh, it's because it has even order harmonics. So what's odd order harmonics and what's even order harmonics? Even order harmonics produces the thirds, fifths, and sevenths, and ninths of a note, okay? And, uh, and odd order harmonics produces the thirds, fifths, sevenths, and ninths of a note, and everything in between. So it produces a so very, very small s distortion spec of a point <coughs> one or, or, or so. Doesn't sound very good because there's all that garbage in between the thirds, fifths, and sevenths of the, of the note. Well, the even order harmonics is, is like heroin to the brain, and, and you enjoy that. And, and that's why when you go to concerts, uh, all the great guitar players are all playing tube, tube <laughs> amplifiers. They're not playing on solid state amplifiers. It doesn't sound good. So the nice happy medium, so if you were gonna divide up your money to spend, get a good sort, get a good speakers, if you like tubes, get a nice tube preamp, and maybe buy them. Put the solid state on the woofer because it's got great slew rate and it's got the bang, and get that tube amp on the mids and the highs. Okay, okay. Um, so, kind of similar to the last question, um, at least I see a, peop a lot of people talking about when they're looking to get something new is buying a piece that isn't vastly better than the rest of their system. Thinking like, well, I don't want to get this amp because it's way better than my speakers or way better than my source. And I mean, tell me if I'm wrong, please. I just look at that like, well, if you don't do that and you want an upgrade, you need to upgrade the whole system at once, which is too expensive and kind of sucks. Um, do you guys see people kind of using that same logic? Or is that logic right or wrong or indifferent? Or is the question, you're looking at me like, what are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> it's something I see all the time, well, uh, but maybe I, you guys I don't, don't. I don't think there is a right or wrong. Some, some people are, are focused on having their system balanced in terms of their budget. Uh, and some people, when something good passes their way and, a, and it's a good value, they jump on it. And I, I'm kind of like, if something passes your way, and it's a great value and it's got a great reputation. Uh, you got two choices. The money could be in your bank account, it could be in your stereo system, but if you're, if you're buying it right, they still both have value. And uh, it's not gonna change because it's not in your bank. Certainly you're not making any money on it in your bank. If you buy it properly uh, and it was a great deal, you, know, you could wait a few months till the next piece comes around to get the system balanced. But that, that's me. Uh, some people want to have a, a decent stereo system. They don't want to think about it past that. They just, I, I want good quality all around, and then I want to go ride my bike on Sunday and not worry about it. And uh, I don't think there is a right or wrong. It's really what really fits your personal needs and wants. Well, and I think buying a new, P, a new amp or maybe even changing out your power cables or, or something like that, just kind of re-engages you with your system. And so it's, I mean, we're all trading up and trying new stuff and it's just part of the process. It makes it fun why we're here, I think. Sure. So uh, do you guys see a lot of people hesitant to purchase digital? Because, I mean, by the time you get it home, it's out of date or, you know, that's kind of the, the common thing. or. People always saying, well, let's wait till this shakes out. And these same people have been saying it for 10 years. You know, I, I don't want to get into computer audio yet. I want to wait till this shakes out. Okay, you know, fine with me. What, how do you guys talk to your customers about that kind of stuff? And, you know, people hesitant to get in. They want to get in, but they just, they don't know what's going to happen or whatever. You know, I, I think you just have to, you can sit around and wait and wait, wait for that deck to get MQA, wait for, you know, you just have to, if you're ready to buy, find the best value and 
that has the most up-to-date feature set and go for it. And if you're buying from a reputable manufacturer, uh, your, your trade-in, as Josh was saying earlier, you know, maybe in a couple of years you're going to do something different. But you got two years of musical enjoyment, so. So, I don't think it ever shakes out. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's what I think as well, yes. I mean, I mean, th there are a few areas where things have over the decades what's good is good and you know and preamps and power amps unless you want to get into uh, you know heavily remoted or theater systems a lot of that stuff how it's built has not really changed that significantly over the years you know especially power amps um, you know a, a really good one 20 years ago is not that much different than a really good one today um, but where things change all the time are in the digital realm and in the video realm. So if you're going to wait for it to shake out, uh, the bottom line is you're never going to buy anything. You're never going to enjoy anything. <laughs> so and you'll and then after a while you'll be you can't hear anymore. Yeah. So <laughs> very true. <laughs> when do you want to start enjoying yeah. something? So, uh, I, I you know I I over the years I've sold a lot of new equipment in the store. I've uh, sold tons of used equipment. But one thing that's always stayed constant over the years, and probably why the, you know, I had success, uh, was to sell value. And I always believed that uh, if you could offer the customer a value, whether it be in the value of a quality used product or even the value of a quality new product or, or just best in category new product, you're protecting your investment. So when you protect your investment, it doesn't really matter <coughs> if you're buying something that you're going to have to rebuy in a couple years. You're, you're still going to re recoup most of your investment, and, and you'll be able to move along and buy a, another piece with different technology. An, another strategy, uh, and, a lot, and a lot of times I, uh, with customers, in being I sell a lot of used equipment in the theater market I don't encourage people to buy the latest because it, in six months it's not going to be the latest anymore so if you feel comfortable with buying something that technology wise is a, a step removed you're going to save 50 60 70 percent over the new price and you're still going to be able to resell it and then you'll still move up the food chain. You'll just be one step behind all the time. And uh, I, I think you could probably apply the same concept to digital is that buy something that's good quality and experience it and either, either get it at, at, at the proper time within the new cycle or, or buy it at the proper time in a use cycle and you'll find you're not hurting yourself. You'll still get to enjoy the technology and and, and you'll protect your investment. Yeah, and, and the chances are too, something that is not the newest model, it's probably gonna work better. I mean, <laughs> if anybody's doing 4K HDR video, HDMI, probably <laughs> have a lot of fun with your customers <laughs> and transporting that around. Um, okay, let's, you mentioned value quite a bit. That is so subjective, right? I mean, what's yeah. a value to you is that's, that's not a value to me and that's, that's correct. So, I mean, value to someone who uh, has an extremely nice home that travels around and is making a, a, a large salary, value to him is having someone come into his home and, and, and have it set up and uh, save him time. To him, that's value. And you, you can't argue that. Uh, his time is valuable. So that's value to him is he's not losing you know he's making a thousand dollars an hour to him value is he's losing money if he has to, to go through what I suggest with buying <laughs> <laughs> yep. audio components or video components based on buying at the proper time in its life cycle uh, and and there's other people like I said at the other extreme that they're very conscious of where they spend their money uh, and then there's 
you know, other people that just want, you know, a, a proper guidance from a sales professional. To them, that's value. Uh, being able to trust somebody, uh, buy it once, and they're not going to trade up again. To them, that's value to know they talked with a person that had a lot more knowledge than them and, and directed them properly. Yeah, there's many ways. There's, there's no right or wrong. It's really, I, I guess that's the discussion. Is it, it's, it's all you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Let, let's touch on that, buying from somebody. So I'm assuming that you guys have had a few customers call or come in saying, well, I read about this online and it was supposed to be the greatest thing ever and I bought it and it doesn't work or whatever. So kind of like the value of you guys, you know, why should people maybe spend more if they could find it online from Joe's discount brokers, you know, why, why do they call you guys? I know the answer, but perhaps well, others don't. Yeah, I mean, we've made a, a great investment in, in building uh, in our stores and having listening rooms where you can experience the equipment. Uh, you can buy something based off a of review, but boy, you don't know if how that's going to sound and how that's going to interact with the rest of your gear. And uh, I think it's always, I think the biggest value we have is that we can assist you as you go through this process in evaluating equipment and give you the ability to actually listen to something, maybe take something home and try it out and see how it works with your system. Uh, you can't do that if you're just buying off a review and buying from somebody online. So, uh, and and we're, if you're unhappy with it after a certain period, you can bring it back. So. Uh, a lot of times you can't tell until you've lived with the piece for two or three weeks. So um, I think that's the value that we add. Yeah, the, I mean, the, the dealers that I know, um, the good ones, the, the, the value in intellectual property that they have is just, it's incredible that they can walk in and set up a system that's far greater than the sum of the parts, mm -hmm. you know, and save you so much time and headaches. That, that, that can still carry over, though, into the online purchase. And, Certainly. Uh, uh, I mean, I, in retail, I was 25 years with a brick and mortar store, and you tried to you know, represent credibly. Uh, but there's also a carryover into the online world that uh, also could still have those same principles and values. The only yeah, thing that where the transaction takes place doesn't matter. It's right. The only where thing, you're buying. The only it. thing missing is, is going into the store and sitting and listening. But you could still have uh, the trust of who you're talking and dealing with. You could still uh, know that you're getting a good price. You could still know that you have the option to return and exchange. Uh, so all those other options are there provided that who you're dealing with has credibility. Uh, I mean, after 40 years, many, many of my customers don't live around here any, anymore. They live all over the country. But uh, they enjoy calling and following the website and uh, uh, getting my recommendation. What do you think? What are your thoughts? And, and they know I'm not trying to steer them into a sale. They know I'm just trying to understand their needs and make a recommendation and still allow them to make a decision. All the other things are still in place, the ability to return, to exchange, you know, guarantee price. Uh, granted, you, you, there's the one thing that's missing is coming into the store and listening, and, and that's important. Uh, but not everybody has that time, nor the desire. Many do. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it, it's really what fits you. And, uh, uh, to some, everybody likes to come into a store. Others, they want my opinion. They're willing to try it. They're gonna, they know that if you're not happy, I don't want you to keep it. Sure. Yeah, I mean, I have, I, it's kind of, kind of weird. Sometimes I think, oh, I value the relationship with this dealer so much. But other times, I'm like, I don't want to get to know this guy. I just want the product and I just want to go home and start listening. You know, so to each their own, right? Um, Let's go to the, this vast audience here. 
<laughs> Can you hear me in the back? <laughs> yes, uh, is there a microphone so the video can hear you? <laughs> I just wonder for both of you, um, I have four kids from 19 to 37, and uh, I mean, I, I can't give stuff to them, you know? I, I wonder what you guys do to get young people in your stores and, and involved in this hobby because, I mean, I don't want to impugn anybody. I look around here, I'm including myself, I see probably more gray hair than any other color. And uh, I just wonder how we can get young people into the retail part of it so that they can experience this stuff. You know, I think that's, that is a subject that we talk about almost on a daily basis. And, you know, I'll go back to the story about the, the writer from 5280 Magazine. The whole idea of just sitting down and listening to a piece of music was so foreign. To him. Um, I have a couple of kids, uh, 28 and 31. They both love music. They go see live music. Uh, I don't think I've caught either one as they were growing up, going into my listening room and turning my system on, uh, which in a way is a good thing. Um, <laughs> but, you know, it, there's, there's more music available to people in more different ways right now. Um, and, and kids are really into music, and I think we just have to try to expose them to better sound, and some of them will, will come around. But that, that is, that's the biggest challenge in our industry, and I don't think anybody's really cracked the code on that one. Well, uh, you know, I understand, uh, you know, your dilemma with your children. Uh, my children are no different. Uh, but, but I do have customers, and some of them are friends, and some of them are younger friends. Some of them are I'm old enough to be their fathers uh, that just through my networking seek me out, just in, you know, local experience. And, uh, there are there are youngsters that have uh, uh, interest. Uh, they're not everywhere, but they're out there, and uh, they like their tube amps, and they like tweaking with the tubes and uh, getting neat stuff. Uh, I I agree, it's a dilemma that it's a challenge uh, for all of us in, in, in the industry. But uh, I, I think the vinyl sales have helped uh, that come back to a little extent. Uh, a lot of uh, the younger generation, uh, they are into vinyl a bit. And as they find out the benefits and joys of vinyl, then they start wanting equipment to back it up. Um, and it takes time, but they're, I think they're out there. It's just they may not be your kids or my kids. <laughs> there, there is hope. Yeah. The, last, the last three days in a row I've been gone, and my five-year-old daughter Shirley has called to have me put Walt for Debbie on via Spotify, because <laughs> I can do it on my phone here and turn it on at home. So <laughs> there is hope. I mean, we have, uh, in the past four or five years, hired a couple of salespeople for our Denver store in particular, I'm thinking of, who one guy is probably 30, 31, and he was originally hired to be a receptionist. And he started getting turned on to the music and better sound. And we made him a salesman a couple of years ago. And now he's, you know, buying a pair of Sonus Faber Olympica 3s and Macintosh tube preamp and, and is really getting into it. So. We're excited about the prospect of bringing some younger salespeople into our, our sales force. So when somebody who is younger comes in, they can talk to a peer rather than a gray-haired guy like this. <laughs> um, and, you know, I think vinyl has brought, I mean, my son the other day texted me and said, I think I'm ready to buy a turntable now and some records. Um, but there's a real education process with with kids and vinyl. I have 
Uh, the owner of Twist and Shout here in Denver is, is, is one of my best friends, and, and he said he has people come in and they, buy, they want to buy a turntable, and he sells some inexpensive turntables to them, and they buy a component turntable, and they get home and they're like, it doesn't work. What else do I need? So uh, <laughs> there's a real education process uh, that we have to do. But, some, but yeah, vinyl has been really good to kind of get some younger people in the store. Um, and I know it certainly had a huge impact on his business. So, um. I mean, I, I try and, uh, with friends that are a lot younger, that, you know, are th they know the business that I'm in and they're curious. Uh, I try and show them certain tricks that not necessarily everybody knows, you know. It's, in some respects, all this is becoming a lost art. But we all know what sound stage is. You know, it's one of the <coughs> the biggest things you can do to show somebody the difference between a, a boom box and actually duplicating uh, the sound stage of instruments being in certain places and having somebody sit in a sweet spot and this and this and that. And uh, when someone sees that, it, it opens up your brain a bit that, you know, maybe I want to know a little bit more about this, you know. Uh, some people say, well, don't I need the bass and treble on my preamp and, you know, what, you know, how do, I, but I want more bass. I said, well, you know, I, I, then I try and expose them to, well, you could go, there's one extreme where you could go complete home theater and every gadget in the world and every little adjustment and tweak. Or you could accomplish changing all these things on a very, very pure and simple level with the most minimal of things. So maybe a line drive instead of a preamp. Maybe if you want a little more bass, change the cable. And, sh and demonstrate to them how if I substitute this cable for that cable, I get, I get more bass, but I didn't add any electronics, and it still sounds super clean. You know, like there's no curtain there whatsoever. Um, uh, on a phonograph record. I mean, who knows that, you know, if you adjust the VTA up or down, change the angle of the tone arm, either up or down, you're going to change the characteristic of the detail in the bass. You know, who knows that? That just, just changing it from level to look just slightly up, right? Uh, you know, you're going to either add or you're going to change the detail and change the bass characteristic, you know? Someone thinks I have to go buy a whole new system to do that. No, you don't. That's rocket science to me. <laughs> Analog. <laughs> well, <laughs> well <laughs> v I mean, there's all these little tricks that you can do. The speaker placement, exact speaker placement, you know. Putting them in an exact spot so that the image is, ex so that, you know, the, the time aligns exactly. You know, if something is off in time alignment just a thousandth of a second, it changes the whole image. So having everything exactly in, in alignment creates, creates this live experience. There's a difference between going in some of these rooms and it sounds awesome, and others and it sounds horrible. Yeah, setup is a big deal. I, I just thought of another question as you guys were talking. Do you ever educate your customers about buying music? And what, what do you tell them? Because they can buy the hi-fi from you guys and go out and download a high-res version of something that's really compressed or upsampled and it sounds terrible and that comes back to you, my system sounds terrible. Or, you know, what, what do you guys tell your customers about music, if anything? Well, I think the biggest education uh, theme that we've had over the last 10 or 15 years is uh, just getting people, when people first started streaming music and Sonos became really popular and we were selling a lot of Sonos systems, we were, we had numerous seminars uh, to educate customers about, you know, MP3 and, and, and getting at least CD, at the time, CD quality uh, streaming going on. 
Um, and so that's been a very, uh, you know, and now with high resolution audio and MQA, uh, yeah, we definitely spend time with customers trying to educate them about that because if you're starting out with a lousy source, the greatest system, it's not going to sound very good. Yeah, I, th I think so. I see so many people just talk about how bad certain things sound and I know what they're listening through is very capable, but the recording has no dynamic range yeah. or, you know, it, it says it's high resolution, but what was the source of that high resolution, right? There's just all kinds of variables that they don't think about. What about other questions? Yes. It's alive? Okay. Oh. Sorry. Um, I think the answer to this question is either one of you could do a masterful job if, if one person came to you with a set of circumstances, but we can't all come to you. And, and, and so my question is, how do we identify the weak links in our systems? Because I've, I've replaced components that were more expensive that were, went down, and I've replaced some components with less expensive pieces that dramatically increased the, the system. And it's always a, it's always a crapshoot. Now, I, I, I know if I came to you and I told you everything that I had, you would have the expertise to say, well, you know, here, th these are probably your areas. But short of doing that, is there a way you can teach us to try to troubleshoot our own systems? Well, that, that's an interesting dilemma because uh, it, it's, like you said, it changes from, from one person to the other. Um, but I touched on it earlier. There are certain principles of what you would try and change first in a system. You know, the, theoretically, what makes a, a bigger percentage difference when you change? So, you know, the, the, the source and speakers are going to make your biggest difference. You know, the, the electronic components, the preamp and the power amp, preamp more than power amp. You know, so generally, I, I, you know, I would, you know, source speakers first, preamp, power amp, cables. Once you get the equipment you like basically in place, then start uh, experimenting with cables and speaker wire. But, but it's, it's not about spending the most money. Like you said, sometimes I spend a little bit of money and I get a big difference and sometimes I spend a lot of money and I actually went backwards. And, and that's where uh, that's where the research comes in and a little bit of asking around before you uh, go and make a change like that. Uh, you can minimize the number of times you do that. I mean, I, I'm a, a, a big advocate of not, you know, it doesn't have to spend a lot of money to make a good change. There's many, many examples of that. You know, uh, some are incredibly oddball that you would never in your lifetime think about purchasing, you know, if, an example, in the, theater, in the theater world, everything is based on changing uh, electronics, you know, the, it's, it's loaded with just every detail and change you could possibly want in the world. Well, and this is going back a ways, but, you know, Dynaco made a little box called the QD2, and it was a patent that was came around in the 50s, right? And it disappeared. When Dynaco went under, it went with them. But then when Dynaco got bought out by Panor Corporation, they resurrected the QD2 box. And what the QD2 box is, it has absolutely no electronics in it, period. It doesn't plug into anything, okay? But it takes, it's, it's a way of wiring speaker wire in a different phasing pattern that mimics five channels which 20 years ago was where everybody was at, right? And, but on top of that, it didn't sound incredibly clear because there was absolutely not one piece of electronics inside the box. And it cost $120. So in the store, we would hook up this Dynaco QD2 box with the McCormick line drive, which the McCormick, which Conrad Johnson now owns McCormick. Well, Steve McCormick, built a line drive box that also had absolutely no electronics in it. Didn't plug into the wall, but had the best possible switching 
and volume controls and the best possible wiring in it. So you would run this Dynaco QD2 box with the McCormick line drive box, which, which sold retail new for $700. And you would run that with one two-channel amp that then all of a sudden fed five speakers because of this phasing pattern. And you would listen to your home theater system. And if someone didn't tell you you were, you were listening to a $20,000 preamp, you'd go, that sounds absolutely amazing. And so the Macintosh rep at the time was in the store. We were a Macintosh dealer. And we had all the racks of Macintosh stuff. And in this rack, we had the Dyna Q QD2 box and the McCormick line drive preamp playing you know, a, a movie. And the, the rep goes, gee, my stuff sounds, it sounds awesome. And I go, but that's not your stuff. That's these <laughs> two little boxes. And, uh, you know, it just goes to show you that just looking around a little bit, but that's a completely off-kilter way that's not really accepted to do, to solve a problem or solve an issue of how to listen to home theater. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's way off in, in, in left field. Uh, but that's an example how not a lot of money can make a huge difference if that's your parameters of what you want to do. It, and it's out there. Steve McCormick, uh, he would come to the store and he would, uh, you know, well, what, have, you know, what do you got in power cords? Well, yeah, we got this one from Cardis and we got this one from Straight Wire and this, and this one's $500 and this one's $1,000. No, I want to see your box. I just want to see your garbage box of power cords. And we take out the, our box of generic cords, and he'd spend an hour going through each one and looking at each one, and then he'd narrow it down to three, and then he would listen to each one of the three, and he says, I want this one on my equipment. I want this one these. And, and sure enough, this $5 power cord sounded better than the other ones. And, <laughs> you know, and then he'd show us another tweak. He says, look, if you mass load, my preamp, what it's going to sound like after you mass load something. So these are things that cost very little to nothing. So he'd sit, we'd be listening to something, and then he'd put his full body weight on top of the preamp, and everything would tighten up, and everything would just get sound that much better, just because you're mass loading something. So th there's many ways, without spending very much money, to get huge differences in sound quality. So I, I also think. It's kind of common sense that anybody that you ask that same question to who has the answer is ob obviously doesn't have the answer, <laughs> right? Anybody who says, oh, yes, I can solve that. I can tell you where your weak link is, doesn't. And the, the value of somebody with knowledge is, I mean, it's invaluable. And unfortunately, a lot of the dealers are gone. It's not like you can run down the street and say, hey, can you come over and check this out? Because if you could and you had a knowledgeable dealer, they could just do wonders. So, yeah. There's well, and I think a lot of it, too, is just being able to take it home and try it on your system. Yeah, exactly. Because uh, going to the most uber expensive, say, preamp may not do it for you. Um, that's the fun of our hobby. If, if you can try out different things in your system and sort of see what's going to make the biggest improvement. And I always tell people, start with the least expensive thing. If, that, if, if you could be happy with spending five bucks and that you get it home and it works, awesome. That's just my style. Steve. You think you gotta take your stuff home because you can write as many good reviews about Maggie's as you want. They're not gonna work for me just I listen to. And yet my sister who is the older than I am, she's the music she listens to.
Yeah. Any other questions? Anybody still awake? <laughs> I mean, just in, in responding to what you're saying, I encourage people to take stuff home. Uh, I, if someone's in my store and, and wants an extensive listen, I, I really encourage, you know, we'll listen to it here, but you know, you really, you need to take it home and, you know, and you need to listen to it for a while. You know, you're not going to know whether you like it or not unless you do that. Uh, I'm, I'm, an I'm an influence on you. The visual aspects of the store is an influence on you. Uh, all these things, uh, you know, unless you want to do a double blind test, which nobody really does anymore, uh, you need to have it home. You need to be sitting, you know, drinking your beer or having a glass of wine at your leisure, playing the music you like for a period of time because. It takes it takes time to figure that out. Oh, I well, and instead of instead of maybe buying a new piece of gear or changing out equipment, you might want to take a good look at your room. I was and just going to say that. Yeah. I know the answer do. to his question, and it's going to be the <laughs> elephant in the room. The and room. The room, <laughs> the room is is a huge impact. Uh, it's the biggest instrument. Yeah, it really is. And uh, you can have the greatest gear in the world, but if they're sitting on tile floors and you got a lot of windows, you're in trouble. <laughs> Very, very few people, I mean, a lot of people at this uh, ex, you know, exhibition of equipment uh, respect setting up a system properly, but that's their, that's their joy and that's their very deeply involved in, in, in that hobby. Uh, but the reality is, is most people out there would, will not sacrifice their, their room environment for the stereo. Uh, they they want a comfortable environment and the stereo uh, is secondary uh, and that's why a lot of people don't want to look at wires and they don't want to look at things uh, big monoliths and that's they want them in wall and they uh, it, it, there's no right or wrong to it it's just it's just <laughs> All right, any last questions before we wrap up? Cool. Thanks, everybody, for coming. Thank you. And thanks, Thank Josh you. and Phil, for participating and listening to my nasally drone. For showing up. <laughs> yeah, for showing up. <laughs>